Hey, hockey fans, T-Boz is 13-3 and three here with top-shelf guest, Philadelphia Flyer legend, Flynn Flon Manitoba native, two-time Stanley Cup champion, multiple NHL award winner, and longtime NHL GM and NHL Hall of Famer, our first Hall of Famer, Bobby Clark. This episode is sponsored by Riverside Bike and Skate, Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Dooley's Pub, Computer Recovery Associates, Eau Claire Ford, and Northwoods Therapy Associates, Mogi. Well, we have to thank Steve Coates, another Flyers hockey legend, for getting this organized with us with uh, with Bob Clark here at the Flyers Training Center here in Voorhees, New Jersey. Uh, like JC said, very excited. First time Hall of Famer for us, so uh, we're really excited. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Grew up in a small town, <laughs> Flynn Flon, Manitoba. You always hear about Flynn Flon, but where in the heck is it exactly, and how did you get introduced to that game? Well, it's northern Manitoba, Saskatchewan border, and we didn't think it was really a small town. There's about 15,000 people there, so, and it was a mining community. And being up north, of course, in the when I was a kid, there was no television or anything. Everybody played hockey. Oh, as it should be. As it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any recollection, or did your parents tell you when the first time was they strapped skates on you? I believe I was probably three or four soon after I could walk, just like the other kids in the neighborhood. Every It was after the Second World War, so uh, my dad had been in the Navy, and was a miner, worked in the mine, as most of the parents up there worked for the mine, and everybody had pretty big families, and there was always a ton of kids in the neighborhood, lots of kids to play hockey with. Were you in a large family as well? No, I'd only had one sister. Okay. But, but lots of the neighbors had lots of kids. And back in those days, you you didn't have cell phones and Twitter and Instagram. You knocked on each other's door and said, hey, let's go to the rink sort of thing. The way... When you look back, we wish all kids had. You know, you didn't have a cell phone. You were just out to go. Your mom threw you out. You go outside and play and figure <laughs> out what you're going to do. So if you're in Flint Flon and you got a long winter, you played hockey. So how about the, the rink type of situation? Did you have, like, local rinks around the town, or did people have backyard rinks, or how did that look? Well, there were backyard rinks, but every neighborhood had its own outdoor rink that the mine looked after, flooded once a week and all that. So we all had plenty of ice and plenty of rinks. You, you know, you had to shovel the snow yourself, but it was just, I, I think that's the way hockey got going everywhere. And it, we've, we're long past all that now. Unfortunately. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately. I, think so, I remember yeah, helping yeah. build that uh Build the rinks with flooding and, the, you know, you get the big scrapers. Certain guys had the scrapers. Certain guys had the shovels that lifted over the over the rink. We didn't yeah. have snow blowers or anything like that. So, no, uh, no. That was kinda, you know, pure hockey. Yeah, pure hockey. A little extra skating, you know, a little yeah. power skating, <laughs> pushing that snow around. <laughs> <laughs> Do you Absolutely. think that as a youth, you garnered some of your skill playing with the older kids? I guess you do. That's how you learn, right? You, you had kids of every age out there playing against each other and if you want to keep the puck or get the puck you better learn how to do it because the guy just because the guy's bigger he's not going to give it to you so <laughs> i think we all learn that way nice i uh, think yeah. you're right you played for your hometown flin flon bombers and juniors and then were drafted in the second round by the philadelphia flyers in 69 you got any fond memories of playing for the bombers well, when you were raised in Flin Flon, you grew up wanting to play for the Bombers. All the kids in town wanted to play for the Bombers. The NHL was a dream, but it was so far away that playing for the Bombers was the biggest it got to be. And when I, I was in the 10th grade and went to training camp and the coach told me I made the team. So I had to go home and tell my dad that I was going to quit school. Oh. and play hockey. It wasn't a very friendly dinner. He wanted me to go to school badly because he worked underground, and he said, I don't want you working with your back like I am. You go to school. But he let me quit, and 
I was, he said, you better be a good player because if you don't make it, look out. I think You're it worked trouble. out. I think it worked out for you. Yeah, it did work out. We, we didn't know when I was 16 or 17 that it was going to end up no, this good. No, his, you pretty much took a big chance, didn't you? Wow. Ben well, you knew, what was, you knew what was waiting for you if you didn't make it, though. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the Bombers at that time, when you made the team, you got a job at the mine, and you worked four hours in the morning, practiced in the afternoon, and when you went on a road trip, you got your full pay and stuff. So I was basically making what a working man with raising a family was was getting, and I was 17. Wow. And all the guys on our team. So it was, you know, it wasn't so scary that if I didn't make the NHL or didn't go advance past junior, I had a good job already. True, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you certainly did. And and I didn't realize that. So you got paid playing juniors back then. Oh, yeah. Probably more than any other. The Flin Flon Junior Bombers probably made, as the individual players, made more money than any other juniors for a long time because they were paid by the mine. Well, once you started getting paid then, there was no going back for you. You couldn't go back and play high school or anything like that if you wanted to. You had to move forward if you were going to go anywhere. Well, we you couldn't go to school. We went on two- and three-week road trips and stuff, so you couldn't go to school when you played then in those days. And the rules were different. Uh, you could play junior hockey and then still go to an American college if you were good enough and stuff. So you weren't uh, limited by being paid. Okay. Yeah, those those rules have changed. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. But they should have come well, absolutely. 60 years ago. Because you're a professional. <laughs> so you went right from, from juniors to the to the NHL and had a, had a really good uh, rookie year. At what point in your growing up and development did you start thinking, hey, I have a chance to play pro here? My first training camp was in Quebec City, and Quebec City was our farm team. It was the third year after expansion, and – I wasn't signed, but I was playing exhibition games and playing. I didn't know. I, I assumed that I would be going to Quebec City because not many players come out of junior in those days and went right to the NHL. Yeah. As it turned out, by the end of training camp, the Flyers wanted to keep me, so they signed me and kept me that year. But my, my thoughts were I was going to Quebec City, the minor leagues. So were you, how excited were you when you knew you made the team, and what was that like? Well, being being excited is is one thing, but being scared as hell, too. You <laughs> I can know, imagine. <laughs> like, what am I doing here? Am I going to mess this up? <laughs> Those kind of things that uh, it was just, you know, if you were a kid like I was and you want to play hockey and you're in the NHL, holy man, can you imagine going on the ice against Gordie Howe or John Bellow or those guys? I was scared to death. <laughs> you know, think about that, though. You were stepping on the ice with legends, one of which is now sitting next to me. Yeah. Uh, hockey <laughs> became you know? his, his legend. <laughs> but you think about that. You're talking about Gordie Howe and probably uh, – uh, Bobby Orr and Bobby yeah. Hall and all those names. When when you think back on all those competitors, is there one that stood out the most that you didn't want to go in the corner with? Well, there, even in those days, like everybody is afraid of Gordy. I think <laughs> for good reason too. Wasn't for it? good reason, yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I was for sure. Uh, but you're youthful. And you're full of excitement and, and everything else, so you never want to show fear. So a lot you go in a lot of times in the corner of somebody you're scared to death, but you don't stop. You're scared to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be more pain, more painful if you stop yeah. than if you follow through. You're not, you're not going to show fear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if you show fear, then that's going to get around, and that's oh, yeah, going to be a very short career. Yeah. So you do what you got to do. Yep. Yeah. Well, you ended up playing 15 seasons with the Flyers, 1,280 games, including playoffs, 1,329 points on 400 goals and 929 assists, and 1,605 <laughs> penalty minutes. All right. I love that. You you played with an edge. Where did that tenacity come from? I don't know. We, uh, my junior coach, 
when you grew up in Flin Flon all the way through, the competition was really good. But when we got to the junior level, my junior coach forced us to be more physical, more um, like every day you work your ass off. That's what you're here for and don't let up every game. And I think that was the biggest teaching part I got coming out of junior hockey. So that's how I knew how to play when I got to the NHL. I I don't know how to dis- even describe it. I know I, I guess I had an edge. I, I did some dirty things, did some things I regretted, just did other things that came by honestly playing the game. But I didn't mind it because other guys were doing it to me too. You know, it's a, there's no rule in hockey that says you have to let the other guy hit you. you That's know? true. So I believe that. So if someone was going to hit me, I might hit him back or try and hit him first or at least be involved. <laughs> there you and go. Add to some penalties. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you were the captain of the Flyers when you when you were with them for ten years. So what what was your leadership style like? That's I never saw myself as a leader. I just saw myself as a hockey player being part of a team, doing what's right to help your team win. The, if a team wins, there's enough success for everybody, you know. And if a team loses. It's pretty crappy for everybody. So my responsibility when they made, once they made me captain was to do the best I could with my own ability, but also asking others to try and get the best they could out of their ability. And it, it was successful for our, for our team anyway. We won a couple Stanley Cups and got to the finals and stuff. So it worked for our team. Well, I imagine just leading by example, you're the top player on your team and, you know, you're sacrificing, you're going in the corners, you're digging, you're scrapping when you need to, you're scoring points when you need to. How could a guy that was behind you not step up and try to do those same things to the best of his ability? Yeah, I think if you're going to ask other people to do it, you better do it yourself. Yeah. You know, and I, I played with numerous great players and really terrific people who we all got together on the same team under Fred Shiro and and won a Stanley Cup, and that's what it takes. Like, great players win, but if you're going to win a Stanley Cup, you're going to be part of a great team. Everybody contributes. So I read a a quote from Fred Shiro one time. He said, 20 choir boys never won the Stanley Cup, and they never will. So what does that that mean? (laughs) Well, he had a lot of neat sayings, Freddie, but uh, I mean, even this far down the road, 50 years later, you look at the teams that are winning. There's skill, but they're tough. They're tough. They got good goaltending, but the players that play on those teams, everybody out there sacrifices, does things that maybe you don't think players should do, but they do it to help their team win. It's always the same, same common denominator to win the Stanley Cup. There you go. It certainly is. You know, you are revered here in Philadelphia, and rightfully so. You know, you've won, like you said, two cups, elected to the Hall of Fame. You and Bernie Parent have statutes in front of the arena. Your jersey's been retired. When you were growing up in Flin Flon, was Philadelphia Flyers even on your radar, or did you have a favorite, a different favorite team growing up? Well, in those days, the junior team was sponsored by an NHL team, and there was only six teams when I grew up. I was in the third year after the first expansion. I was a third-year player, so I liked the Detroit Red Wings, obviously, and didn't see them on TV or nothing because we didn't have TV until I was 12 or 13 years old, but... My dreams of Gordy Howe were like dreaming of God. <laughs> <laughs> and then you ended up getting to step on the ice with him. Yes, against him, scared to death. And later in life, his son Mark lived two houses from me in New Jersey. And Gordy and his wife would come down to visit the grandkids and stuff. And he'd stop the house and we'd get to talk and stuff. I was retired by then, but man, oh, man, what a, 
What a thrill. What a terrific, terrific human being and a nasty player, eh? It was great. <laughs> well, that's what you want, though, right? Oh, gosh, You want yeah. the tiger on the ice and, oh, and, and, the, and the, you know, all-around human being off the ice. He, and he was just a gentle, my, if I'm not talking too long here, my granddaughter, my daughter, who you guys met out here tonight, and she's about three or four years old and went to school with Mark's son, Travis. There, and I, I she come home from school, and I said, "What'd you do at school today?" Oh, Dad, we were playing horsey on Grandpa Howe's back. <laughs> <laughs> Bertie was at the kindergarten with his grandson, and the kids were riding on his back on the floor. I said, "Oh my gosh, oh. my idol for life, <laughs> Bertie Owen. But what a terrific, terrific man he was. You know, he stands out in your mind, obviously, but. Um... If you're on the ice and you're getting ready to take a draw, who's the one guy that you faced off off against that was the toughest center you ever faced? I had, because of the style I played, you know, the, some center, good centermen weren't physical and stuff. So, but to play against a guy like Daryl Sittler, he is oh. he is a really good player. And he had a nastiness to him. Brian Trotje was a little cleaner, but he's like playing against a truck. You know, <laughs> really good. I'm just like, so th those kind of players for me. And, and the other guy who I really played against, who I loved was Henry Richard, but he wasn't physical, but he could skate and work and you get in your own way, get admiration for your opponents. You don't necessarily like them, but you admire the way they, play the game and in my case you know there's others i could if i look back far enough there'd be others but sittler and trotje were top top opponents oh we're gonna take a minute to give a shout out to a couple sponsors computer recovery associates specializes in removing monetizing and recycling computer hardware from large data centers whether you're looking to relocate repurpose sell or recycle computer recovery associates can help Check them out at ComputerRecoveryAssociates.com. And Northwoods Therapy, they take pride in being your choice for physical therapy in the Chippewa Valley since 1981. Northwoods Physical Therapy is a clinic where you can receive the care you deserve and you're treated like a family. And Eau Claire Ford Lincoln Quick Lane with a large selection of new and used vehicles available. They buy nice used vehicles any day of the week except Sundays. Eau Claire Ford is here for all your parts and service needs for your vehicle. Ask us about our pickup and delivery options as well as Saturday service appointments. Visit us today in store or online at www.eauclairford.com. Eau Claire Ford Lincoln Quick Lane, proud sponsor, proud sponsor of the breakout sessions. That's a mouthful there. <laughs> that <one>. was. <laughs> I got through it. <laughs> All right, Bob. Two Stanley Cups. Looking back, both of them have a significant part of your life. Is there one that stands out more than the other? The first one, of course, because if you don't get the first one, you don't get the second. So obviously for me, winning the first Stanley Cup was uh, sure as close to heaven as I'm going to get for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and when, when you are on that ice and that – silver chalice is handed to you and you can pump that baby over your head mm. you know a million things are going through your mind but do you recall you know at that time what what was going through your mind when you're lifting that thing i can't really i mean you're you're so excited and you've put the most committed hockey you've ever played towards winning it there's a relief too thank heavens i finally won you know, <laughs> it might never happen again, but I got this one. But yeah, it's for me. The first first cup was so special. Do you remember who you handed the cup off to? Well, Bernie Perrant was the uh, Conn Smythe winner in that tournament, that playoff, and I grabbed him right away, and the two of us carried it. I didn't think it was because we didn't win because of me. <laughs> we won because of the team. Oh, that's and that's a great. I hear that admiration. often. Team, yes. team, Always. team, team. I don't hear me. I don't hear I. I hear no. team. That's that's what makes it, right? Absolutely. 20 guys coming together that's and making it, it happen. That's what makes it all worthwhile. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about 
Bob Clark, the individual, though, you've won so many NHL awards. You've won the Bill Masterton Award, the Hart Trophies in 73, 75, and 76, Lester Pearson Trophy, the Frank J. Selke Trophy. Which one of those prestigious awards means the most to you? And I know that's the individual part, but what means the most to you? It's If you pick one out, then it, it may demean the others a little, and I would never do that. They're all extremely important to any individual who ever won them and you know to be mvp in the league of great players like i never saw myself as one of those kind of guys wow. but the, the selkie trophy the defensive player of the of the year kind of for me said I'd already won MVP, so you kind of said you can check, so you must be a complete player. You've learned to play the game properly and do all parts of the game. And usually MVPs go to the big scorers and all that stuff. And then the Conn Smythe was, or not the Conn Smythe, I mean the Selkie, the well, defensive player of the year. That, well, that was really neat for me. Sure, that does show yeah. a complete player. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. All around for sure. You're on the ice facing off. And you look left and you look right. Who are the two wings you want there on your line? On my line? Yes. Reg Leach and Bill Barber. Oh, that was easy. That <laughs> came that easy. Was, that was, yeah. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did they bring to your line? Uh, well, they were both 50 goal scorers. Barber's in the Hall of Fame. He was a complete package. He could check and everything and and reggie could skate and shoot and reggie played a little a few less years with me but all three of us just and we knew each other instinctively how that happens i don't know but it was a different era and we played together for probably seven years six seven years wow. so and that made the responsibility of in our case scoring goals but checking and doing all those things they relied on three of us. It wasn't like you're two guys tonight getting a third guy tomorrow like the game has changed to now. You had that responsibility as three guys to play at the – we were the top line on our club. We had to play at that level, and for a lot of years we did. You certainly did. You brought an yeah. edge too, a good one, Mo. Mm -hmm. So did you have a favorite teammate through all the years that you were playing? Uh, Well, Reggie Leach and I played junior together. So we were really close, and I liked, I mean, not all my teammates I didn't, I liked, but Simone Olay, I played with for three or four years when I first turned pro and sat beside him for those years and stuff, and he worked for the Flyers as a scout for years. He was, he and I were close. Bob Kelly sat next to me for eight or nine years, and we were close. He was a pain, but we were, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, but you always oh, got that oh, one friend, right? Oh yeah, well, <laughs> you know when you're trying to put your skates on, and he's putting his leg out here, and his big ass stuck over on you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. But, and he still works for the Flyers. Terrific, terrific man. <laughs> are Are there any deep down? Secrets or, or stories that you could share on any of the road trips of the shenanigans you guys pulled on each other? Well, you guys know, you, you get 20, 25 guys together and you're out drinking beer and stuff. There's going to be lots of crap going on. And mm -hmm. Freddie was, Freddie Shiro was the first coach who acknowledged, obviously everybody in those days drank beer, but he was the first one who brought beer into the dressing room. And if a game ended, Say you were in Chicago, you, instead of getting a taxi back to the hotel, he'd take the bus and take everybody to the bar and everybody get off the bus and jump in and go have some beer and then go back. He said, he, his feeling was, he said, if you have to find your own taxi and get there, you'll probably stay longer. <laughs> oh, smart move on his part. So I'll go. just get you there. And okay, boys, you time to go. Home. Yeah, I'll hold up the bus. Leave earlier. <laughs> he had some weird say things, but. There's yeah, probably some truth in that. There's a method to his madness, kept, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah, it kept the team really. A lot of times what happens to great teams is after 
so many years together. People get their individual lives. And, you know, your friends are not always the hockey players. They're doctors, lawyers, whoever you run into, your friends with. You get different parts of life, and it changes because the team that was so close isn't going to ever be as close again because we've all got different friends and different lifestyles and all that. And uh, our team was stayed close for four or five years, but eventually, it, you know, guys get traded and broke up. Does guys get married, then they start having some babies and stuff like that? That affects a little bit of that nightlife, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. It, it changes everybody's life. I mean, yeah. we all know once you have some children and stuff, your life changes. Sure. And should. It, it should. You're yeah, right. You're priorities. right. <laughs> time yeah. to, priorities, time to yeah. put some things aside. Yeah. yeah. Setting Mr. Uh, Bernie Parent aside, toughest goalie you've <laughs> ever faced? Tony Esposito. Oh, yeah. Legend. Yeah, I thought Kenny Dryden was really, really good goaltender, but Kenny had much better teams in front of him than than Tony did. And Tony had good teams too, but I thought Tony Esposito was just – I probably never scored on him. Maybe that's why I say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, he's a he's a Michigan Tech alum like our friend Coatsy. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. A, a fine, fine individual. Moog. So, Bob, growing up, you had a struggles with type one diabetes. Okay, was that any? Did did people look at that as something that might hamper your professional career or your ability to play pro? Did you ever have any issues with it as you? We're a young man growing up. I, I understand that a lot of times guys would come into training camp and that was their time to get in shape, but that wasn't you. You were you kept yourself self in shape all the time. You were kind of ahead of your time in that regard. Just a little bit. In, uh, I got diabetes when I was, I don't know, 12, 13. And in those days, I didn't know anybody who had it, so the doctors – got me on insulin and regulated my diet and all that. And, uh, you know, I said to the doctor, can I, as long as I can play hockey, I, I wasn't so worried about having diabetes. I just loved hockey that much. And he says, yeah, you can still play. He said, probably playing goal will be easier, but you can still play. So after that, I was just diabetes. I just, I was a hockey, you know, I became a hockey player who had diabetes. Diabetes had no effect on it affected the way I lived. Obviously, I had to watch what I eat and when I eat and all that kind of stuff. But generally, uh, it was not an excuse for playing poorly. Sure. Yeah. And when I was drafted, uh, hindsight tells me I was the best junior in Canada. And I was picked in the second round because people with ignorance about diabetes made a decision the scouts the general managers made a decision that i wasn't going to be strong enough to play in the nhl because i had diabetes and ed snyder who owned the flyers was at the draft and we had a scout named jerry melnick out of edmonton who kept pushing me and pushing me so he called it mr snyder called a doctor in philadelphia and asked him could this kid with diabetes play hockey the doctor said sure is long as he takes care of himself so the flyers took me and after that it's you know it's all uphill for me or downhill i don't know where I, where I was going. <laughs> you did I, it. I mean it was yeah i was given a chance to play hockey and that's all i wanted like every other young player well so, you didn't let excuses stop anything did you 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 just forged forward with your dream yeah the, the, well that's all you have right it's you know i i, I used to say i never seen a hockey player described a, a separated shoulder hockey player the broken leg hockey player <laughs> why are you calling me a diabetic hockey player i'm a hockey player i just happen go. to have diabetes i didn't separate my shoulder but you know those kind of things it's just it, was, it can get carried away with 
some of the crap that goes on. Sure, sure. <laughs> We're going to give a quick shout out to a few of our sponsors here. Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine has been committed to the health care needs of patients in western Wisconsin since 1954. The orthopedic surgeons and athletic trainers serve many area schools. Their success and reputation as an outstanding orthopedic clinic can be attributed to the fantastic staff that they have, and they're going to be putting Mogi back together here shortly. Riverside Bike and Skate, Eau Claire's Hockey Headquarters, which is the oldest store in the state of Wisconsin. Buy hockey gear from the people that play and know the game. And don't forget about their bicycle sales and service, as well as your paddle sports center for kayaks and canoes. And Dooley's Pub has been Eau Claire's home for hockey and all sports fans since 2005. Dooley's Pub is a proud booster of the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and all local high schools. Dooley's is located on historic Water Street, providing excellent food and service, and has all of your favorite sports televised at all times. Bob, I think you touched on this part of uh, our conversation already, but following your playing career, you were the GM of the Flyers for 19 years. And you were also the GM with the old Minnesota North Stars, mm -hmm. uh, the Florida Panthers, and you reached the Stanley Cup Finals twice with the Flyers and once with the North Stars. So what was your recipe for building such high-quality teams? Uh, you better have good goaltending. Obviously, everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> you better have a lot of good players who are going to work. Um, our Flyers teams for years and years were – the biggest teams in the league. And size is important. I mean, you can have small players. Every team's got smaller players who are very, very valuable. But you're going through four rounds of the playoffs. You better have some size. And, of course, talent, skill. That the, You look at the teams, the skill level, of a team like Vegas, my gosh, that uh, that Eichel kid, holy mackerel! Oh like he's, boy! Yeah, he's when you watch him now, you know how far behind McDavid is this kid? Uh, I don't know, but he's reaching those levels. That's having a player like that on your team, and he's working. He's changed from the player who was in Buffalo. Yeah, you know those kind, all those things come into play, but there's no one way to win a, a Stanley Cup. It's you got to have a whole good team and a whole good goaltender. That's the best start you can get. You mentioned Vegas. They're starting right where they left off last year, too. They're really hot to start the season. Yeah, yeah. And the game today is so highly skilled and fast and stuff, but there's also a way more injuries in the game than there used to be. And that affects... You know, if you lose two or three of your top players to long-term injury, it's going to affect the team immensely. Yeah. And especially you get in the playoffs and a couple of your guys get hurt, boy, that can change a series. We all know that. But I think there's far too many injuries in the sport now than there needs to be. But the changing of the game, the taking out the red line, all the changes that have been put in have been put in for, I guess, the right reasons. But now I think we've got to look at, or not me, not we, the league has to look at all these key players getting hurt so often. Do you think putting the red line back in the game would uh, would help with that? Would you want to see that back? I don't know what the result would be, so I think it would be too big a change to put it back in. And it was, it was well planned. Bettman – put the two-referee system in, and none of the general managers wanted two referees. We didn't think it was necessary. No, but he put them in, to his credit, and the reason was because he was taking the red line out. He just didn't tell anybody. So uh, three or four years later, the red line, he took the red line out, and he's already got the two-referee system in place, which was smart on his part. But the, there, there are rules now that... I believe lead to more injuries. I think icing is a wasted part of the game, but it happens. But when the puck goes down the ice and goes through the goal crease or goes through that, whatever they call that the thing. Tra trapezoid. Trapezoid, or yeah. If it goes through there, the goaltender should have to play it. 
but they call it icing now so that tired players have to stay on the ice against fresh players, which, of course, is so the fresh players can score. To me, that's a pretty non-skilled way of getting goals scored. Make the goaltender play it. All these goaltenders handle a puck like defensemen, some better than some defensemen. <laughs> Very you know? true. If that puck is going to go into the trapezoid or through the crease, make the goalie play it. Keep the game going. But, I mean, no, that's just a minor thing that bugs me because I don't like icing. But <laughs> well, Should we get Bettman's phone number for you? you give, him a call. <laughs> give him a call. Oh, no, he's... I, I like Gary. What Gary Bettman has done to hockey has been holy mackerel. Look at the jobs that he has created in this sport. Yeah. In every every team, you look at the size of the scouting staffs, the all the broadcasting, the trainers, everybody. It's he's done an absolutely incredible job. And uh, just because I don't like some of the things he's done doesn't mean I don't like Gary, and doesn't mean I think I'm right. I just disagree with some of the things he's done. Sure. And, and you make a valid point, though. There's a lot of individuals out there that have disagreements with Mr. Bettman. But as you look back at how this sport has grown under his leadership and some of the changes he's made, mm-hmm. you've got to admire the guy for some of the things he's done. And I agree with well, that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I don't know anybody. Of course, I don't know that many people at his level anyway, but I don't know anybody who could have done a better job than what he's done. For If you come from a working class, I was a player rep, and my dad was a minor stuff, and you provide more jobs and more money for people and everything, then that guy is a guy I like. Hard to argue you with know? that, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. <laughs> you can't. An opportunity, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because he's done it for all of us, all of us in, in hockey have yeah. benefited from him. Yeah. I want to step back for just a second, uh, back to your playing days. And I play defense, not very good at it. Thank goodness I got a long reach. That's all my <laughs> asset is. And if I've got Bobby Clark coming down and one-on-one with me and you've got that smile with missing teeth, I know that you're nothing but a mean <laughs> son of a gun coming down on me. I'm, I'm going to poop my pants, okay? So now let's flip the roles here, and you're going down one-on-one on a D. Which defenseman do you not want to go up against? I was never uh, fast enough to beat defensemen one on one or tricky enough, I, but the the guy, the two guys that were the hardest to play against were Dennis Potvin for me and Serge Savard. Oh. Those like Dennis was meaner. You had to be careful playing against Dennis, and he was a he was a big tank out there too. But Serge was so smart. You never you were never going to beat those kind of guys. And if you got too close to Potvin, you might get hurt trying. So he was a little, like, in my opinion, if Dennis Potvin had played for the New York Rangers and not the Islanders, there'd be statues of him in New York. Oh. He was, you know, and Serge obviously was one of the great defensemen of all time. You know, JC, I'm glad you brought back to his playing career because he's had such a legendary one. So tell us about your experience playing for Team Canada in that iconic Summit Series. That was it. That was a. I mean, when I, I was the last player invited to camp. Oh, no kidding? <laughs> yeah, it was Walter Kachuk who played for the Rangers and was a really good defensive player, was invited and couldn't come because he was running a hockey school. And in those days, playing the Russians, well, were so much better before it started. Uh-huh. So. Anyways, Al Eagleson called me and asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, of course. I was 22 or 23, and a chance to play hockey, plans to play for your national team? Oh, gosh, yeah, I'll be there. Tell me when and where. And and we went there. They put Henderson, Ellis, and myself together, and we were, all of us, just hoping that we were going to get, everybody was promised a game, but hoping we were going to get a chance to play. Sure. So while other players were... A lot of other uh, the players weren't getting prepared to play. We were. We really worked, the three of us. We just said, let's work our asses off and make sure they, that when we do get a chance to play that we can help. Yeah. And we made it out of training camp the first game, and we were 
one of the better lines for Canada, and we were through all of Canada, actually. We, we might have been our best line. And so that we played every game. And, and that, with hindsight, you look back after, that was a pretty impressive series. And to play every game, you had to be doing something right. And in, in Russia, Phil Esposito was the best player. But Henderson scored the three game-winning goals, the last three games when we were down. So I think as a line, we were probably the best line on that team over eight games. And it wasn't because I wasn't a highly skilled player. Ellis was really good, solid checker, and Paul Henderson could skate and score. We weren't just as a unit, we were really good. So... um I got wandering a little bit there. So anyways, that that whole series turned out to be one of the biggest uh, in Canadian hockey history yeah. and will always be considered that. Yes. Yeah. It, it was a special special team at that time. I think that cemented Paul Henderson as a iconic Canadian hockey player. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Series, Henderson yeah. and he deserved it. I always say you know, you can get lucky and score one goal, maybe two, but not luck to get three. <laughs> he knew what he was doing, and he did it and helped us win. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you ended up getting involved in a conflict with a Russian player, Valerie Karlamov. Kar- yeah, yeah, Karlamov. Yeah. How did that transpire? It was a different kind of... That happened yeah, that, earlier with Jonesy, too. Uh, well, that's all right. We still, the video's still good. We're all right. There we go. Okay. <laughs> it was a different kind of series for us because in the NHL, fighting was allowed. So it took care of a, if someone got dirty, he was going to have to fight. But now we're playing the Russians and fighting isn't allowed. And their type of toughness was the type of dirtiness that we didn't use over here. There's lots of sticking and slashing and all the kind of things that if you did in the NHL, you would have had to fight. Took care of itself. Yeah, the fighting took care of that kind of stuff if a player did that. So Harlamov, he was a pretty good player. Some thought he was the best in the Soviets. I didn't. But that's here nor there. And he, we were on the ice at his fifth or sixth game, and he, he stuck me and then turned one way and... I turned the other way and we went back up the ice and I kind of hunted him down and gave him a good crack across the ankle. Apparently it broke his ankle. I don't know. Didn't care either. <laughs> I, was, I was probably hoping it did break. I mean, I didn't, but I hit him pretty hard. And it did. I mean, I didn't feel bad for it. I did what was the game at that time was in that series. That was being allowed. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I never felt bad about it. And I never... It never made any difference. It never came up, really, until Paul Henderson brought it up that he told his grandson not to do that kind of stuff that I did, that Clark did to Karlamov. So he said he didn't want his grandson doing that kind of stuff. So then it became a little bit of an issue, but it's no big deal. Okay. I like it. what you had to do. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, yeah, I did, yeah. Kind hey, of there justice. wasn't one player on our club who was mad at me. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So Esposito said, you, "Why didn't you do that the first game?" <laughs> <laughs> Set the tone. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got some battle scars through the years here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And any anyone that stands out as the most impressive because you got you got quite a few there that you know the memory banks kick in and you go, "Oh yeah, that one was a good one." Uh, most players got got cuts and stuff. We, there wasn't shields and very few helmets and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my scariest one, I wore hard, hard contact lenses and Billy Barber, we were playing in a playoff game and Billy went to lift someone's stick up and it come up and caught me right in the eye. And I had to go to the ophthalmologist after the game and he dug out a couple pieces, of ch- a couple chunks of the contact out of, out of my eye and the eye ended up just being scratched but he said I had I not had the contact lens I probably would have lost my vision in that eye oh my so gosh that, you know I was just lucky oh absolutely uh, just an accident but I was lucky that time wow cuts and stuff never I didn't care about yeah, that stitch them up and get back out there right? yeah everybody everybody did the same and yeah. and the other 
they taught you never, your teammates, don't ever let the other guy know you're hurt. If you're hurt and you can't get up, then you're hurt. But try not to ever let the other guy know he hurt you. Whereas now the referees, because of the way the referees have to call a game, players, you know, if they get hit with a stick, they go to the ice and they embellish it more and they got their hand in their mouth and stuff where in those days you didn't ever want to let anybody know that they, they hurt you. Do you but, think you guys were tougher back then? Than they no, were oh no, God, no, no. Okay. I, I, th- every generation of players is tough. These guys play a game that's, uh, more, what would be the word? Footballish scrums. They get six guys in the corner pushing and banging and, Stuff like that. We never had any of that. You had more one-on-one battles for pucks and those kind of things. But these guys are equally, equally as tough. And because they're faster, and now the glass is so hard, and the boards are so hard, when they run into each other, that's why so many. There's so many injuries. It's just so fast, so hard, and they hit so hard. And we used to be able to defend ourselves. If I seen you coming, I'd get my stick up in front of my face. So you'd slow down or else you're going to run into the stick. You can't do that anymore. It was a big change that Mr. Batman made, but it is what the game is, and the players know it now. It's But when you could defend yourself, there was a lot less of the craziness, crazy hard hits. Do you think the the players had a little more respect for each other when – it? In your era, there were very few helmets, no masks for the the forwards defensemen. But now everyone has a helmet, everyone has a shield. Do you think that has uh, kind of changed the game a little bit more, a little bit less respectful, sticks come up a little bit more because guys are protected? I don't know if the right word is respectful. I think it's changed the game so, so that it's so much different. There was a time when... If you didn't have a helmet and stuff, nobody would try and hit anybody else in the head. You know, you did that. And your equipment, the equipment that was worn was if I tried to hit you too hard, my shoulder pads weren't offering me much protection. Oh, sure. <laughs> you, you know, the equipment they wear now <laughs> is so much better that it allows them to move much faster into each other. And they don't have to worry about anybody bringing a stick up to defend themselves so they can hit a lot harder and yeah. stuff. It's just a game. But these guys are tough. They're, they're, the players that are playing today are tough. Nice. That's good to hear. Back in your era, contract negotiations were a lot different than they are now. G- give our listeners a little insight on how you negotiated a contract with the Flyers. And did you ever have any differences of opinions with whomever you were negotiating with at that time? When I first started, it, it was all one-year contracts. Players had very or no rights really so uh, my first camp i they wanted to pay me their first contract offer was 7500 in the nhl and 5000 in the minor leagues well i was making more than 7500 working in the mine so at least i had something to fall back on and i wasn't worried about the nhl but i wanted i figured i if i'm going to go to the miners i should make 10 grand because i was making close to that working in the mine and I hung out all through training camp, and when when I finally made the Flyers, or they were sh- sure I'm making the Flyers, then we signed a contract, and I did. I got 14 in the NHL and 10 in the minor leagues. So, I mean, both sides were happy. And the next year, same. It wasn't the same story, but I wanted a little more, and I was talking to Keith Allen and stuff, and we eventually settled on something that was fair. And the third or fourth year, agents started coming into play. Okay. And that's when uh, the world hockey come in to s- started too. So players, a lot of players signed to go to the world hockey. Because, and, the, and you're getting raises, for big raises in those days. Like you might have been making 20 in the NHL, 15, and you could go to 35 or 40 in the world hockey. So it raised the players in the NHL, of course, yes. the NHL players had to start doing getting paid the same as yeah. well. The world hockey helped the players a lot. I don't know, like playing in that league, if it helped them, but 
certainly the salaries in both leagues went up. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Dang. So, Bob, looking back in your long, long, long career as both a player and a GM, do you think there's anything you'd do differently either as a player or a GM? The one, the one thing I was still a good player when I retired. The Flyers, Mr. Snyder, who owned the club, had gone to California and turned it over to his son, Jay, to run the club. And Jay wanted to change things. I was still good enough to keep playing, but he offered me the GM's job. And you're in my position. I don't want to leave the Flyers. So I'm thinking, well, if he thinks that I should be GM, he obviously thinks uh, – I might not be able to help the team as a player, mm -hmm. and I could get traded, which I didn't want. So anyways, I took the GM's job, and uh, at times I wished I would have kept playing. If someone asked me today, <laughs> I would say, play till they cut your legs off. <laughs> but I, like I, I, didn't, I didn't follow that, but I didn't follow my own advice. But I, You still have a role with the Flyers today. What's your role, and what's a day-to-day -day life with Bob Clark? Uh, when Paul Holmgren was a general manager, I, I was active as a senior vice president. And then we've had s different general managers. And um, my role is I'm a, I'm a senior vice president who does nothing, but who's really good at it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, uh, it's true. I, I, shouldn't be doing, I, I, I shouldn't be doing anything. I, I'm lucky I can come in. And sit down and talk with Keith Jones or Danny Breer or Alan McCauley, the top people running this organization. Just talk with them and talk hockey and all that. How sweet is that? Yeah. But I don't have any, re I don't have and don't want and shouldn't have any re real responsibility. Okay. Just, I just, I'm just lucky to hang around. As well, they're, see, they're lucky to have you. You know, oh, you're obviously you, an icon in the organization oh, and and the whole Philadelphia yes, yeah. and the state and the NHL. So they're, yeah. I think they're lucky to have you. <laughs> Do you, you ever get down, invited down to the locker room once in a while to give a little pep talk or you know show your Stanley Cup ring yeah. or anything like that? I wouldn't do that. I, you wouldn't do that, no. I, once in a while, a coach has mentioned doing something like that. And I said, Christ, they won't even know who I am, these guys. I played 50 years ago, 40 years ago. How do they know who I am? <laughs> oh, they know who you uh, are. Yeah, they, Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that. I can't. They don't need me telling them how to play. I couldn't play as good as these guys do now anyway. Even I think when you I could play. <laughs> oh, Bob, this has been absolutely um, a genuine a great conversation and we truly appreciate the time you took to talk uh, to us my pleasure thank you very much for inviting me and for having me oh you're welcome ladies and gentlemen yeah. please don't forget to leave a a review on your social media platform it helps us stay in the game mogi oh huge thank you again to our special guest bob clark and thank you to your our audience folks thanks a lot for listening please remember our sponsors riverside bike and skate Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Dooley's Pub, Computer Recovery Associates, Eau Claire Ford, and Northwoods Therapy Associates. Follow us on your favorite social media platforms as well as YouTube. And remember, folks, until next time, keep your head on a swivel and stay on your inside edges.